Hear God's word. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God in Corinth, together with all his holy people throughout Achaia. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we're distressed, it's for your comfort and salvation. If we're comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we'd receive the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. In him, we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. Amen. May God bless to us this reading from his word. Let's pray together. Lord, come and speak to us today through your word, by your spirit, that same spirit who inspired prophets and apostles of old to write these sacred words of scripture. Bring them to life for us today, we pray. Give us ears to hear, eyes to see by faith, that we may be conscious of your presence here in our midst and that you are our teacher. For, Lord, there's nothing I can say as a human being that can meet the need of the heart or the soul. Only you can take the words of a human being and give them life to us. And so that's my prayer today, that you will give us life in these moments together. In Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> a number of years ago, I was standing outside a pizza shop with my father waiting for our supper to be cooked, <clears throat> and we had a conversation about life in the church. My dad had been an elder in the church I grew up in. Um, I think he was an elder for probably 30 years um, before they moved churches to another community um, related to work. And he said to me in those moments, you know, I don't feel today as close to the Lord as I once did years ago um, when we were doing different things or whatever. But the point was, he was at a point in his life where he didn't feel the nearness of God or that he was as close to the Lord as he once had been. And what I want to do today is try and address a reality that not many of us talk about in the church or are even prepared to consider because there is a reality, I think, that we do experience as part of the Christian life and as part of Christian formation, and that is what I will call, after St. John of the Cross, the dark night of the soul. Now, when St. John of the Cross talked about the dark night of the soul, he was really talking about a movement that moved us towards unity with God. But over the years, the dark night of the soul has come to refer to not just that movement towards unity in God, but to those moments in our Christian lives when it feels like the darkness has flowed in, when it feels like we've lost hope, we've grown discouraged, and we feel sometimes overwhelmed with a sense of hopelessness or uselessness that anything we say or do makes a difference. Now, you remember the, the ad advertisement for the Hair Club for Men? Uh, I'm not just a, a participant, I'm the president, um, obviously. Um, well, the same thing applies to the dark night of the soul. Um, what I'm going to describe for you today 
relates to me because I've been in the dark night of the soul, probably more times than I'd like to count, but it is a reality. And sometimes when people get into the dark night of the soul, the church's response has been to spiritualize the response. And so what we often say to people is, well, you just need to read your Bible more. You just need to pray more. You need to be more regular in worship. Or in worst case scenario, what we say to them, you need to deal with the sin in your life. Now, if your theology of suffering is this, that life should always be full of uh, cream and cherries, then nothing I'm about to say today will relate to you. But if you have a theology of suffering that acknowledges that suffering happens in our lives, that bad things happen to good people even though we didn't choose them, and that trials come in our lives, but that God meets us in those trials, then the dark night of the soul may have some meaning for you. They're not disconnected, the dark night of the soul and a theology of suffering. And what the church needs to rediscover today, I think, is a solid theology of suffering that allows us to realize people go through stuff. And the best thing we can do as brothers and sisters in Christ is help them get their stuff to Jesus because he's the only one who can heal and mend broken hearts. And so when we talk about the dark night of the soul, that's where I'm coming from. It's this place where it feels like everything you do doesn't matter anymore. It just feels like God has left the building. Now, we all know the theology is different. God hasn't left the building. He doesn't leave us or forsake us. That's his promise. But sometimes in our lives, it feels like we're walking through a season of emptiness and meaningless. So, meaningless. so how do we understand this dark night of the soul? Well, let's understand it through the teaching of Paul in 2 Corinthians 1. Paul writes to the Corinthians who seem to be aware of the struggles that he's had in Asia. He makes a vague reference to it here. And he highlights in this passage the depth and the significance of the trial he went through where it says in, in the Revised Standard Version, it says, we were utterly and unbearably crushed. The NIV says, we were under great pressure. I don't know, that's a very sanitized version if you ask me. The point is that Paul was in a place of great distress in his life. As a matter of fact, in, in verse 9, he, he, also in verse 8, he says, we despaired. And that's a word that is used very rarely in the scriptures. And what it implies is the unavailability of an exit from the circumstances you find yourself in. And what Paul is saying, we thought we were in a place of no exit. Darkness had grown around us, the trials had come, and we did not see hope. We despaired. And verse 9 says that by his estimation, he was given a death sentence with no hope of reprieve. And so, what we begin to see from the, from the Apostle Paul is that there is a reality that Christians experience, and that is trials come. And sometimes we go through the dark night of soul because we've experienced a loss. Someone we loved and cared about, a transition in our church where leadership changes. Someone, a close friend, moves away. Every loss that we experience needs to be grieved in an appropriate amount. I've probably told you this story before, but when I was um, ordained, one of my neighbors in Sydney, a very dear, dear old saint, gave me a gift pen set. It included a fountain pen, a ballpoint pen, and a pencil. And my favorite pen has always been the fountain pen. And somewhere about 20 years ago, I lost that pen. I had to grieve the loss. But in the last seven, ten years, I lost both parents. I needed to grieve the pen an appropriate amount. I needed to grieve my parents an appropriate amount, but two very different processes of grieving. And when we come to experience loss, part of how we deal with it in a healthy way is to lament our loss and to give that 
loss to the Lord and begin to meet Him in those places of loss. So one of the things that can be a catalyst for a dark night is the experience of loss. It can also come as a result of an accumulation of disappointments in life. One of the things I dealt with in my dark night of the soul after I burned out a number of years ago was my disappointment that ministry had not gone the way I had hoped it would in the church that I was pastoring. I had hoped and prayed and expected God to move in powerful ways and that revival would break out in the congregation. And while though it broke out personally in the lives of many people, including many of our elders, it did not take the form or the shape that I wanted. Now, let me, did you hear that? It did not take the shape and the form I wanted. And in my dark night, I had to wrestle with my disappointments with God. So sometimes it's disappointments. Sometimes it's just change that happens in our lives that we didn't anticipate and don't really want, but it becomes a reality, like COVID. It brought change that none of us wanted, but it forced us all to deal with it. And these are just some of the things that can be catalysts for the dark night of the soul. So how do we understand them according to Paul? Well, one of the first things that strikes me about all of this is that the dark night for Paul had lots of darkness, but we we need to recognize that the darkness doesn't limit God. There's a great verse, I think I've probably mentioned it to you before, from Exodus 20, verse 21. It says this, Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read that, it hit me like a two-by-four. You know, that's where you get hit by the spiritual four, and you begin, begin to sing, He touched me. I read that, and I thought, but God is light. Don't we meet God in the light, and doesn't He bring light into our lives? And yet, this, this verse reminded me that it's often in the dark places of our lives where God meets us and does His best work. And so one of the things that strikes me, and this is the beginning of understanding of the dark night of the soul, is that the dark night is always superintended by God. He is always present with us in the moment. Paul opens his letter to the Corinthians here in the usual way with the usual salutation, but he very quickly moves into a discourse on the comfort received in the midst of suffering. That's verses 3 to 5. Now, we don't know exactly what Paul's trials were. I'll give you five possibilities of what those trials might have been. One might have been his fighting of wild beasts in Ephesus. That's from 1 Corinthians 15, verse 32. One might have been his suffering 39 lashes, and Paul suffered 39 lashes. And and in case you don't know, when someone suffered 39 lashes, that was supposed to be sufficient to kill a person. He suffered it five times. That was the punishment religious leaders gave him for not towing their line. So five times he received 39 lashes, Uh, It might have been the riot in Ephesus, which we read about in the book of Acts, instigated by Demetrius the silversmith. Um, Could have been the unsuccessful attempt at the mob killing of uh, Paul. Um, It could have been a particular persecution in Ephesus that was pointed at him in particular. And you can look at Acts 20, verse 19, or 1 Corinthians 16, verse 9, and you get some references to those kinds of things. Or it could have been just some debilitating attack by some recurring health issue that he struggled with. And that seems to be the favored uh, trial of most Bible commentators when they look at this section of Paul's life. Whatever it was, this is what we know. Paul felt the power of the darkness crowding in around him, a trial to the extent that they despaired of life and saw no hope for reprieve. And so we see that Paul is familiar with trial and with darkness. But where does he look in the midst of those moments? He looks to God, verse 3, the God of all compassion, the God of all comfort. 
Jesus uses a word for the Holy Spirit and his ministry in our, in our lives called the paraclete. And its root has to do with comfort. One who comes alongside of us to comfort us, to walk with us. The word comfort is used in these verses between 3 and 7, 10 times. Do you suppose Paul wants us to pick up on something? That there is a comfort that's available for us, even in the dark night. I saw this report from our international director of African Land Mission this week talking about a couple of our uh, leaders who went to visit in a village and they were invited to lunch from one of the local church leaders. And so they went and they enjoyed a fabulous meal. And at the end of the meal, our leaders got up and they wanted to thank the family and bless them. And so they began to pray a blessing over the family and over these leaders in particular. And as they were praying and blessing them, the wife broke out sobbing out loud. Well, their first response was they thought they'd done something to offend her. And so they started to backpedal a little bit. But then the husband said, no, 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 you haven't offended her. Here's the issue. We've been serving here in this village for 13 years. And never once has anyone come to bless us and encourage us like you have. And you don't even belong to our denomination. And he said, it's the joy of being blessed for the first time that has brought out these tears. One of the things I've learned is that in the dark night of the soul, God shows up in surprising ways and through surprising means, often surprising us with people who come alongside and who bring the comfort of God to our souls. And so in the midst of darkness and trial, God meets us often in these surprising ways and means. The challenge is to remember that even in the trial, when the darkness seems overwhelming, that God is still present and he's still at work. The dark night is always superintended by God. So if we grasp that, then let's now understand why God allows us to experience the dark night of the soul. St. John of the Cross talks about seven different sins that need to be purged from our lives, and I'm not going to elaborate on them a great deal. I'll go through these very quickly just to give you a sampling. But the, the, the dark night of the soul takes away all of our crutches, the things that we've come to lean on and depend on in our Christian lives that are not expressive of a dependence on Christ. One of the things that we often do in our lives is take control for ourselves. Sometimes it comes out of our lack of faith that God will actually do what we want him to do, so we, do, we take care of it our, ourselves. And so... One of the things that happens in the dark night of the soul is, is God strips away all of those things from our lives so that we once more learn to depend fully and wholly upon him. When Paul talks about despairing in verse 8, he, he's really, in many respects, renouncing all hope of survival except through God. And so here's the million-dollar question for the day, and if you don't get anything else out of this morning, take this home with you. Ask yourself this question. If all I have is Jesus, is that enough for me? If all I have is Jesus, is that enough for me? Because many of us want to do, I want Jesus plus. And one of the things the dark night of the soul does is remove the plus, the add-ons that we come to lean on and depend on that take away our dependence from God. So here are the seven sins that, that uh, <coughs> excuse me, St. John of the Cross talked about. By the way, John Calvin said this about this dark night. He said, even saints need to be threatened by a complete collapse of human strength in order that they may learn from their weakness to depend entirely on God alone. 
So, first uh, sin of the dark night that needs to be purged is spiritual pride. Spiritual pride is where we'd rather teach than be taught. It's where we'd rather lead than be led. It's where we'd rather be served than serve. You get in the picture? It's where we become satisfied with ourselves and we become the measurement of the Christian life for everybody around us. The second sin is spiritual greed, where we become discontented because we believe we're not getting what we deserve. Okay, I'm not going to spend long on this, but here's the ground I fall back on. I don't deserve anything good. I'm a sinner, estranged from God because of my sin. I don't deserve anything good. It is only by the grace of God that I get anything good. Now, that's what I say with my head. My heart sometimes has some different thoughts. That I deserve something better than what I'm getting. (coughs) Excuse me. Spiritual greed gets into that whole area where we believe we're not getting what we deserve. And it's really about Christ being formed in us. Replacing our desire for the things that supplant Christ. Now, when we talk about greed, let's be clear, I'm talking about greed in the spiritual sense, but let's also not be fooled into thinking that material things won't also become an attraction that can lead us away from dependence upon Christ. The third sin is spiritual luxury. It's the purging of false loves. A recognition that the deeper Christian life comes with deeper temptations. And with the dark light, our passions, our thoughts, and our fears are all brought under the lordship of Jesus Christ. The fourth sin to be purged is spiritual wrath. That's when the soul begins to experience the benefits of the Christian life and then has them taken away. And it can turn into anger, it can turn into embitterment, often expressed towards other people in church and certainly expressed towards God himself. It can be a loss of the benefits of the Christian life, so a a change in church leadership can often be a catalyst for this where we begin to feel disappointment with God and frustration with the direction things are going. It can be as simple as our devotional lives are sagging. And often the target is God. The fifth sin to be purged is spiritual gluttony. That's where we become addicted to the sweetness of the benefits of the Christian life. And what happens is that we begin to move into extremes. So, for instance, in this particular sin, spiritual gluttony, spiritual exercises like fasting go to the extreme. It's where we begin to fast excessively. And often what happens is that we begin to treat God like a vending machine. You know how a vending machine works. You put in your toonie. I hate to say that because I remember the day when I used to put a dime in a vending machine and get a bottle of pop. Gone are those days, obviously. You put your coin in the machine and it gives you what you want. And many people in the church today treat fasting that way. Well, if I fast, God is bound to give me what I'm asking him for. And that's a misunderstanding of fasting. The point of fasting has always been to give ourselves to the Lord first and foremost, to take more time, to give up things that take away from the time given to the Lord. That's the point of fasting. It's not to express your devotion. It's not to express your faith. It's not to express how religious you are. It's not a vending machine by which you put your coin of faith in and God is bound to reward you. And purging the the sin of spiritual gluttony gets to the heart of that. The sixth sin to be purged is spiritual envy. That's where we don't delight in the growth of others, but we envy it. And then finally, spiritual sloth is where we cease from spiritual exercises and disciplines because we don't get the desired result. 
For years in Toronto, when I was pastoring there, a number of churches used to get together and we'd do concerts of prayer. And our focus was to pray for revival in the city and for the church of the city. And at times, we would have 500 people in the city hall in Scarborough uh, gathered for prayer as we prayed for the city and as we prayed for revival. And here's one of the trends I noticed. People would come once, twice, three times. But after that, if revival didn't break, break out, they lost interest. Think about the prayer meeting of the local congregation. How many churches now no longer have a prayer meeting? Why? I can't begin to guess why, but one of my guesses would be because sometimes we don't think we're getting the results we're looking for. And so these are the things that the dark night of the soul addresses. It tries to strip away from our lives so that we are being, so that Christ is being formed in us more fully. As John the Baptist would say, I must decrease that he might increase. So here's what happens in the dark night of the soul as these things begin to get stripped away from us. Through the dark night, pride gets transformed into humility. Greed gets transformed into simplicity. Wrath gets transformed into contentment. Luxury gets transformed into peace. Gluttony gets transformed into moderation. Envy gets transformed into joy. And sloth gets transformed into strength. In the dark night, we begin to perceive our own smallness before the greatness of God. All of our crutches get stripped away. And let's be clear, let me be clear, that sounds very sanitized and easy, but when you're in the dark night and these things are being stripped away from you, it is painful. But it is worth it. Because then Christ is being formed more fully in us. And to go back to St. John of the Cross, we get, we get to move a little bit closer to that union with God that is our ultimate destination. The dark night is permitted in our lives so that we can grow up, so that we can be weaned from selfish pleasures and so that Christ can be more fully formed in you and me, so that we can realize that if we have Jesus, we have enough. This was Paul's summary statement. He said, but this happened, verse 9, that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. And Paul literally was feeling like he had experienced a resurrection. From the trials where there was no hope of reprieve to being alive and able to speak about the comfort that he had received. And so finally, let's understand that the dark night is also a bridge to someone else. So we understand that God superintends in the dark night. We understand that God is with us in the midst of it all, guiding and directing us, that he's stripping away the things that remove our dependence on everything other than Christ. But then finally, let's recognize that the dark night is a bridge to someone else. Let's go back to this passage and read verses 5 to 7 once again, where it says, For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we're distressed, it's for your comfort and salvation. If we're comforted, it's for your comfort, which produces a new patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. What's he saying? He's saying, what you see God doing in me can encourage you because you're going through the same stuff. And God meets us in it with his comfort. Verse 7, and our hope for you is firm because we know that just as you share in our suffering, so also you'll share in our comfort. Go down to verse 10. But he's delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us again. 
On him we've set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. Just as you help us by your prayers, then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. Here's the principle that Paul's laying out here. The comfort we get is the comfort we give. The comfort we get is the comfort we give. For years I've said to folks in the church, when you go to work as a believer, people are watching you. They'll watch your everyday life in the office and how you conduct yourself. And there may be those who will ridicule you and your faith. But when a wheel falls off in their life, guess who's going to be the first person they turn to for consolation? It'll be the person of faith. A person who's been present and steady, who's been observed as they've gone through trials in their own lives, And it's at that moment that we're able to say to someone, I know something about what you're experiencing, and here's how I got through it with the help of Jesus Christ. The comfort we receive is the comfort we give. That's the principle. Over this last year, there have been a number of Christian leaders who have been imprisoned in Somaliland for their faith. They've been in prison for months at a time, never knowing whether they were going to be released or sentenced to death. Some are still in prison in Somaliland. I get prayer requests every month from, or every day from the Pray Africa website, which sends a different prayer request related to Africa and African peoples. And over a series of of months, the prayer requests have come for these people who've been in prison. And the question I ask is, why should I pray for people in Somaliland? Because the comfort that I've been comforted with, I can offer to someone else by way of prayer. That's actually the principle that, that also goes with this. You see from Paul in verses 10 and 11, we pray for others because we're connected. I often say to people that we're involved locally in our churches, but we're responsible globally. We can't turn a blind eye to the needs of people around us. So that means that the comfort we receive as believers in Jesus Christ, we want to share with the lost who are around us here in Ottawa and in our neighborhoods. We want them to know the comfort that we've received. But that's also why we pay attention to unreached people groups around the world and want to see them come to faith in Christ because we want them to experience the comfort with which we've been comforted. So the dark night of a soul builds a bridge to somebody else who's going through a similar experience. I have a definition for the church. My definition of the church is that it's a teaching hospital. Now, in all of our lives, at some point or another, we need a hospital, either to get born in or to die in, or for everything in between, for every injury and sickness that we go through. But in the Christian life, once we are born, born again, by faith in Christ, we're a part of a community. And at some point we get well because of the care that has been given to us by the others in the community. And at that point we get up and we begin to take on the servant role. Maybe we begin with changing bedpans. Maybe we begin with caring for the children in the nursery. But we begin to pick up service within the teaching hospital and we begin to learn how to serve until we get to the point where we can begin to teach others how to serve. That, to me, is the best definition of the church. There is a movement in the Christian life from rebirth to maturity, where what we received, we pass along to others. Paul expresses the connection to prayer in verses 10 and 11 through all of this. And his invitation is for us to join in that prayer, to join him in the comfort that we extend to others. 
Here's a reality that I want to give you. God loves you, God loves me too much to waste our pain. He will use it to form Christ in us and then to build a bridge to other people so that Christ can be formed in them. Sam is one of our missionaries. She works among the Digo people uh, who live between Mombasa and southern Kenya through to um, Tanzania. And she tells of spending her days doing things like having conversations with people in the community, sitting, drinking chai with uh, members of the community, uh, going to community celebrations and, and participating in community life, um, talking about holding babies. That's part of her regular day and what she does. But she also talks about spending time with one of her neighbors. And this neighbor is a believer, but she has been debilitated by uh, a disease that took away her ability to walk. And she's a 30-something single, um, as Sam puts it, full of sass and hilarity. And she says that's probably one of the reasons why we hang out together. But she says this neighbor um, who contracted spinal uh, tuberculosis in middle school now has to walk with one of the metal frame walkers. That's the only way she can get around. But she regularly expresses the hope that one day the Lord will touch her and she'll be able to walk again. And so Sam and her friend, as they were having a visit one day, shared the story of Mephibosheth and David in the Old Testament, explaining that God's heart is like David. If you remember the story, Mephibosheth, uh, you know, M. He was one of Jonathan's sons, and David asked, is there anybody left after all the dust had settled? Is there anybody left in Saul's house that I can bless? And there was one, Mephibosheth. And so he brought him from the place of hiding to a place where he sat at the royal table and gave him all the royal benefits. Well, their comment on that story was that God loves to honor us, crippled, dirty, and broken, and restore us to a place of honor. He invites us to come and sit at his table. You see, the comfort that they knew from the gospel of Jesus Christ, they now passed along to this one who struggled day by day with mobility. The comfort we receive is the comfort we give. Let's go back to verses 3 and 4 once again, just as we wrap it up. This is what Paul says. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus the Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can trump- comfort those in any trouble with the comfort with which we, are in comfort- we have been comforted. Let me ask you this, are you in the middle of the dark night, a place where life doesn't feel like it has a whole lot of meaning or hope, even as a believer, to feel like the things that you do don't make any difference? Then let me say this to you, don't despair. God is present. God is forming Christ in you. And God is building a bridge through you that will one day make sense in a relationship with someone else. God is superintending in the darkness over all that we experience. May that be our guiding hope as we acknowledge the reality of the dark night, but live with the hope that comes from the comfort of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, we are thankful for that verse that reminds us that Moses approached the thick darkness where you were. And my hope and prayer, Lord, is that for these people, they never get to that place where they experience that thick darkness unless 
it can be the means that draws them deeper into you. Lord, we say that we want more of your life, more of your power, more of your love and compassion in us. But we don't always acknowledge that there are things that we hold on to our lives that don't make room for that. And so we pray that you would strip away from us the things that we lean on, the things that we depend on, that take away from our dependence upon you. And in our disappointments, in our losses, in our challenges with change, meet us. For it is only your perfect love and your perfect presence that can transform our lives. And so today, here and now, we offer ourselves afresh to you and pray simply that you would pour in your comfort, for we need it, but let us be good stewards of it as we try and comfort those who are around us, that they may find hope in you just as we have. For it's in your name we pray and for your glory. Amen.